Welcome, everyone. Is this on? Welcome, everyone, on a beautiful, beautiful Vermont spring day. Yes. Aren't we lucky to live here? Um, I have two announcements. One, please turn off your cell phone. And second, according to Triple E's bylaws, I need to inform you that on uh, April 26th, there will be a meeting of the members. Usually, um, we don't get very many people. And it starts at 1, and the lecture starts at 2. Members have the ability to vote for officers um, and to discuss with the board um, any problems, concerns, um, accolades they want to pass on to us. Um, it is our time for the board to tell you what's been going on at our board meetings, what our hopes are for the future. And it gets very discouraging if not very many show up. I am going to announce this for the next four weeks and I'm going to urge you, <laughs> I can't pay you, but I will urge you to come to the annual meeting. And one of the things you can do by showing up is to show us that you appreciate what we do. Thank you. And now, Beth will introduce the speaker. I'm very pleased to welcome Bridget Butler here today, AKA the Bird Diva. Um, she has been working in conservation and environmental education in New England for over 20 years, including with the Audubon Society. And now she travels the state of Vermont doing presentations and uh, leading bird walks and doing TV and radio interviews and surveying birds for landowners. And today she is here to tell us about the owls of Vermont. So this with pleasure, I welcome Bridget Butler. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, I want to thank all of you to start off for coming out and being here today. Um, because sometimes, you know, driving can be a little bit sketchy. But I see that the power of birds <laughs> was just much greater than the weather today. So thank you for joining me today. And I'm really happy to be able to come and share my love and passion for birds with all of you. Um, so today, what we're going to talk a little bit about are the owls of Vermont. I want to ask you guys to start off with, how many of you have seen an owl this winter? Yeah, raise your hands really high. OK, super. Um, and so one of the questions, and we're going to get this question out of the way right to begin with, one of the questions that has been kind of popping up all over the place is, why were people seeing so many owls this year? And it was mainly barred owls. And a number of different scientists started to look at what, what was the cause behind this. And one of the things that tends to happen during this time of year, especially this year, is we get a lot of snow, right? And we got a lot of ice this year. And that made it really hard on hunting for owls. Couple that with the fact that last year, there was a higher population of rodents available. That meant that all of those nestlings from last year had a much greater success rate. They all had full bellies, so much many more of them survived. So we had a lot of young first year owls this year. Um, and so there were more of them. And there were less mice. So that boom and bust of the kind of rise and fall. So all these young owls. And of course, the young owls don't do too well against the mature owls. The mature owls are able to push them off of the prime habitat. And these younger owls end up, you know, well, coming to our backyard to hunt. Um, and so it was nice for us to be able to, to see some of those birds. It was a stressful winter for them. Um, but just like those natural cycles up and down, um, Mother Nature will take care of all of that. So it 
balances back out until that next boom and bust. So I'm happy that all of you got a chance maybe to see an owl this year. And I'll tell you a story about how I didn't later in the show. So tonight, today, this afternoon, all of the owls that you're going to see um, are owl photos, for the most part, that it come from photographers from all over the state. Um, for those of you who know me, I am not a photographer. I'm just the person that watches the birds. And so I'm always looking for great photos, like this one from Tyler Paquette. This is from down in Addison County, probably two years ago. Anybody know this species of owl? Snowy owl, yeah, great. How many of you have seen a snowy owl before? Wow, that's awesome, okay, good. Um, we didn't have as many of them this year, but um, Tyler got this great photo. And so at the end of the slideshow, there's a list of different um, people that uh, took photos for the slideshow. So if you run into them at any time or are um, friends with them, please thank them very much because they kindly donated their photos for my presentation. Oh, I know. Okay, yes. I wish I could record the action of people that, you know, the sound that people make every time I put this slide up. Oh. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you how big this owl really is. This is the northern sawwet owl. This is the smallest owl that we have in the state. If you think about a can of soda pop, that's about how big this owl is. It's a very, very tiny owl. Um, and so some of our owls actually stick around during the winter or show up here during the winter, and we're going to kind of um, talk about each of those different kinds. This one actually has to leave. If you think about this winter trying to um, find a rodent when you're the size of a can of soda pop through the ice and snow while dodging the bigger owls that are also looking for rodents, you don't want to stick around. So this tiny owl, northern sawwet owl, they are um, partially migratory, so they're going to move out of this area. They like coniferous forests. So if you look down in the lower um, right corner of each slide, you're going to have see little icons that kind of tell you a little bit more information about the habitat and the nesting. So these guys like to nest in cavities of dead trees. And they'll also come to nest boxes. So we'll also be talking a little bit about what you can do for owls to keep them on the landscape. Um, and keep them happy um, and continuing to make more owls, which is the other thing that's happening during this time of year, is most of our owls are either on eggs right now or about to be on eggs. Um, and that's why wintertime is such a great time to go out and look for and listen for owls as well. So with this little owl, Vermont is like in the heart, the core of its breeding range. They do leave, but they're starting to come back now. We've actually had a couple reports just this week of sawwets being seen in different places. <clears throat> so March and April are for courtship. Um, and then they're going to be a little bit quiet as they nest. And the hatchlings are going to come out, oh, let's see, around um, uh, May and June, and then be raised through the summertime. So what's really cool about this owl is that I've got this great picture. Oop, we're going to do the sound first, not the next picture. Sorry. All right, so vocalizations. So I, I said that March and April are for courtship. So one of the ways these little guys are able to connect with one another is through their voice. And that's probably one of the best things about owls is all the different voices. And I'm going to get all of you to call like owls today. So. Be prepared. Leave now if that's uncomfortable for you. Um, but we are going to be hooting in just a minute. So this little owl has a, a, a call that it uses to be able to attract a mate and to set up a territory. And what's great is it sounds like a truck backing up. So it just does that boop, 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 which you guys can do, right? This is the easy one. We're going to start with the easy one. Ready? Boop, 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 boop. Perfect. Perfect. So don't go out right now and do that outdoors. Well, maybe you should, because maybe a little sawwet owl will come and visit you. This is what it really sounds like. Whoop. That's not what I meant to do. Sorry, I am juggling a microphone and a clicker. And I'm not doing a good job. There you go. Intense, right? But if you think about needing to be able to communicate through a coniferous forest that holds its needles all year, 
you need to be able to have a, a, a pitch and a volume that is going to carry. So these guys hunt from really low perches, and they will actually cache their food during the winter time so that they can have it later on when the babies are born. Now, of course, if you're going to call that loudly, you have to be able to hear back. And I think that's one of the questions I get a lot is like, where are the ears? And for some owls, you'll see those little tufts of feathers. Those aren't actually the ears. We'll talk about those later. But the ears are kind of on either side of the owl's head. If we think about um, the facial disc that we saw with this little owl, right? That kind of circular dinner plate kind of shape around either of the eyes. That's actually kind of like a catch basin for sound. It's shaped almost like a parabolic microphone would be shaped in order to funnel the sound out toward the ears. And the ears are on either side of the head and they don't have like an external ear like we do. It's just like a hole there. So the feathers do the job of pushing that sound toward the hole. And the other crazy thing is that they're asymmetrical, which means one ear is higher than the other. And that way, the owl can triangulate when it's hunting. So it's listening for mice and moles and voles and things under the leaf litter, under like much shallower snow than what we have now. And they will cock their head back and forth in order to be able to hone in on where that mammal prey is. So it's really kind of cool to have one ear up higher than the other. All right, Northern Sawet tiniest owl that we have in Vermont. And these guys, we can actually help them by having nest boxes for them. So Audubon and Cornell Lab of Ornithology, if you look online, they have a number of different nest box patterns that you can build for them. The other thing that you can do as a landowner, how many of you own wooded forest land somewhere? Or maybe have woods in your backyard, right? So one of the things that we can do is we can leave dead trees that are going to be safe on our property in order for uh, the owls to have a place to nest. Um, and to actually, these little guys, like this next one, take cover from some of the larger owls. So <laughs> this one, this one is just a little bit bigger, not by much. You can barely see it here because it's got that camouflage thing going on, right? So they've got this cryptic coloration that helps them blend in with their surroundings. This is Eastern Screech Owl. This one is in its gray phase. And so there's actually two phases to this owl, which you'll see in a minute. Um, and the gray phase is the more common owl that we have here in Vermont because, well, it kind of blends in a little bit better during the winter time. Um, this one sticks around, whereas the other one does not. This one, for some reason, is able to push into different areas, mainly in the Champlain Valley where there's a little bit less snow cover some years um, and still be able to find food. So again, these guys, very similar to northern sawwet, like coniferous woodlands, they will nest in dead tree cavities, so that means we can also provide them with um, nesting boxes as well to keep them on the landscape. So these guys nest in April and May. May and June, we're going to see the young, and then they will fledge in June and July, and probably stick with the parents for a little bit um, to be fed. We're at the northeastern edge of this bird's range. Um, and so it's likely, as um, climate change kind of, um, well, advances, that this bird will stay here um, for quite some time. Other birds um, were on the southern end of their range, and we may see them disappear from our landscape. So this little one, there's the gray phase and the red phase. So if you think about it, in Vermont, many of our trees um, have more of a, a gray bark tone to them than they do the red bark tone. And what's really interesting when I start to think about climate change is one of the um, climate adaptive species of trees is actually red oak, which does have a little bit more of a red tinge to the bark. So it'll be interesting to see if we see more red morph phases um, as we advance through time. That would be an interesting study. So eastern screech owls, these guys are one of the first owls that we're going to talk about with these little ear tufts. So if they're not really ears, what are they? Anybody got a guess what they're for? Recognition of each other? It's a little bit more about blending in, again. 
So if you think about trying to make yourself blend in on the end of a dead tree stump, right? Is it nice and smooth and round? No, it's like fragmented, right? Um, the sticks that break off of trees too, right? You'll see this a little bit later with one of our other um, species that has these little ear tufts as well. Um, also, you will be able to tell the mood of the owl a lot like, like our dogs, right? With the tail goes up or the tail goes down. If the owl is very um, agitated, those ear tufts will flatten out a little bit, okay? If they're in conflict with one another. So sometimes we can read body language from birds as well. And luckily those ear tufts can give us a little bit more information. Here's what these guys sound like. This one's really hard um, to mimic. Um, I know some people that are really good at some bird, some birders that are really good at gathering a lot of spit in the back of their throat and then whistling through it. Ew. I am not good at that, and I'm okay with that. So it's a descending kind of whinny. And then they have a tremolo. Let's see if I have the tremolo um, as well. And it's kind of like one note that just goes out. That one pulled out a little bit more. Nope, we just, nope, oh, he's going to keep going. Anybody heard that one before? Ooh, good. Awesome. Seen it? Awesome. I have not. There. Ooh. Different tone, different pitch. Sometimes between males and females, um, and we'll hear that a little bit later with another species, the, the tone, the pitch is different. So you can actually, when you fine tune your ear, you can hear the difference between male and female as well. These guys are doing all right in Vermont, and they're mostly concentrated in the, there. <gasps> That's the one where you blow bubbles through your spit. It's a fun one to try to teach kids to do, because they love that. Um, so this one is mostly concentrated in the Champlain Valley in Vermont as well. All right. How about this one? So we've got a couple different symbols across the bottom here now. Barn owl. So this one is gorgeous coloration, those beautiful little freckles across the chest, that tawny brown color, um, that heart-shaped facial disc as well. Um, and it's really sad because that, that circle with the line through it means that we don't have them breeding here in Vermont. Whereas Eastern Screech and the Northern Sawet, both of those owls breed here. This one does not. We haven't had records of this bird breeding in the state since 1983. And we haven't had a lot of sightings of them either, except for one of my friends, my new birding friends, Morgan Quimby. She's a budding photographer. She lives in the Jericho area. And she got a picture of one last year. And I was like, you need to send that to the Vermont Birds Record Committee, because that's a big deal. So much more it needs to be studied about this bird. We're really at the northern edge of its range. So we used to have them in more so in southern Vermont. We're just not seeing them as much anymore. At the same time, with climate change, this bird may come back into our landscape. So a lot more monitoring. They're declining also regionally as well. And in Vermont, they are listed as special concern, which means they get a little bit more attention and, and at some point in time, possibly some more funding um, if we do find a breeding pair um, here in Vermont. The, the reason for their declines, that little grass symbol there, means that they like open grasslands and fields. So as we see grasslands and agricultural fields start to either convert due to development or even just convert due to s natural s succession. So they go from an agricultural land to shrub scrub. Um, that means that it's less preferable for that type of owl that likes to hunt um, in those types of habitats. The other big one um, that um, impacted the population of this bird is vehicle collisions as well. And some of you have, may have even experienced that this year. And Hopefully not the collision part, but like the almost part. So one of the things when these birds, we experience heavy snowfalls during the winter and ice, the birds get pushed to forest edges and actually roadways as well. If you think about it, that's an easy place to hunt. Um, the shrubs have been pushed back 
and that moment that that mouse or meadow vole do darts across the road, it's open, it's wide open. Um, and if there are car lights there too, maybe that makes it a little bit more visible, but it's also much more risky for them as well. So vehicle collisions um, have been a problem for this one. One of the things that we're starting to see is a resurgence in interest in grassland birds, especially in Vermont, like bobolinks and meadow larks. And so as um, different organizations work with landowners and farmers to improve those types of um, grassland habitats for those birds, we may actually see some of the owls that depend on those grasslands during the wintertime months especially um, start to come back. So this owl, if you've ever heard this owl, it will raise the hairs on the back of your neck. The only time I've ever heard this owl was when I was in Massachusetts and I was working for Mass Audubon and I was on an overnight there with um, staff. We were um, at an old farmstead, much like the Green Mountain Audubon Society here in Huntington. Um, and we were all sleeping out outside and um, we heard this. It's also like, <laughs> nails on a chalkboard kind of thing. But the owls find that attractive <laughs> to each other. <laughs> or if you're another male owl, it's serious business that you should not be in the same territory because it's already taken. So if you hear that, please <laughs> record it <laughs> and get it to your nearest Audubon chapter because we'd like to know if we, um, we will be having these guys across Vermont once again at some point in time. All right. Oh, gosh, this bird. Jeez. So if you fall in love with barn owls, I think your heart will really feel for this owl. I, um, gosh, this is my new owl crush, I think. So this owl is um, smaller than the, the larger owls, like barred and great horned. And it's just much more delicate and svelte. This is the short-eared owl. These guys nest actually on the ground in grassland habitats. And we're actually at the southernmost edge for this species. So this is really more of a northern species um, of bird. It's a rare migrant to the area and a casual resident, which means sometimes we have them here year round, but most of the time they pop up here when the food sources up north aren't as great. These guys love meadow voles. And what's really cool about this bird is they hunt right at that time when it's like, it's, it's dusk. Dusk is the best time to go out and look for this bird. And they are amazing because the flight pattern of this bird it, you will not confuse it with any other bird. So if you're out open field with a woodland nearby, because they like to um, roost, especially in swampy forest woodlands, and out of the woods, low flying, comes this butterfly-like owl with that gorgeous facial disc. And it's crazy because the, the body stays still and the wings do this gorgeous butterfly flap as they come um, cruising um, like just level over the ground surface in order to find food. They are intense. Those yellow eyes, absolutely beautiful. Question mark means that we don't know if they're breeding here or not. So it's possible that we have good habitat for them, um, but we're not sure whether or not we have a breeding population as of yet. Best spots to go for this bird. So if you go and look up on eBird, eBird is an online platform where birders upload their sightings of what they've seen and when they've seen it. And it generates a map. So you can actually go in and type in short-eared owl and type in Vermont, and it will show you all the places where um, people are seeing short-eared owls. The hot spot right now is Gage Road in Addison near the Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you go right now, like today, well, maybe not today. I don't know. The weather's not too bad. It might be good. But if you go between 4.30 and dark, you have a very, very good chance on Gage Road of seeing one of these birds come out of the woodlands there and hunt. In fact, multiple birds. So there have been, I think, between three and six individuals seen at any one time there. The other hot spot for these guys, although we haven't seen them show up yet this year, is up at the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge. So you drive past the visitor center and there's those gorgeous farm fields all along the left. And the bog swamp area um, 
Maquam bog is there. They come out of the bog and across the field there. And my kids have the most killer life bird list ever because it's all the really awesome, rare birds. So this was like the perfect kid adventure, right? Like a bunch of snacks, 4.30 after school, we're going to go. We can get back in time for dinner. We pulled over on the side of the road and stood in the middle of the field, and these owls came out of the woodland and flew right over our heads. It was amazing. And they were all like, ah! No, they were fine. They, they got into it after the second one came out. I was like, you guys, look, there's another one. And there were two flying over us. So last year, we had really great sightings up at um, the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge. And right now, Dead Creek is a really great place um, to go for this bird. These guys are also in um, decline as well. Um, they're very nomadic, which means that they will go where there's food available to them. And one of the big impacts on this bird is habitat fragmentation and conversion as well. So again, they need like a wooded area, nice w wooded forest that's intact, and then they need grasslands to be able to hunt in as well. And so you need those two things um, next to each other. Um, one of the things that's helped this bird is to um, be able to work with landowners. Um, especially farmers on a, a different mowing regime for some of the farm fields. Um, and um, conversion from, a, um, from to, to hay from row crops as well. So what you're growing um, can also um, keep these birds on the landscape a little bit more. Gorgeous, gorgeous bird. I hope I see one this year. So here's a shot of one from Dead Creek. You can see just a, just a different um, body shape to them, too, in the way that they hold their bodies as well. Beautiful facial disc as well on this bird. This is what they sound like. They're screechy, too. I find that the owls that prefer to nest in the grassland areas have more of that screechy sound than the owls that are in the woodlands. So it's something about how the sound travels across those two different habitats that's very important to the way that their vocalizations have evolved. All right, here's another one. <gasps> oh, gosh, I would love to see this one. This is another photo by Tyler Paquette. Um, Tyler is this really awesome young birder. Um, and a couple years ago, he did a how many birds can I take photos of in one year? And he did it as a fundraiser so that he could raise money to send somebody to the Hog Island Audubon camp. Um, and so if you ever see Tyler or you get a chance to meet him or cross paths with him online, tell him thank you for all of his work to kind of continue his passion for birds and pass it on to others and sharing photos with me for sure. So um, this owl, same kind of habitat preferences as that um, short-eared owl. They're really poorly known. We don't know a lot about them, and we don't see them a lot in Vermont. Again, we're at the southern edge of their breeding limit here. Um, they, uh, they are a migrant, and they migrate based on the prey that's available again. So if the prey item that they like, the meadow voles um, and other rodents kind of crash, then they may show up here. The cool thing about these guys is during the winter time, they like to roost together. They like to hang out together, much like crows do in the wintertime. So if you find one, there's probably more than one nearby. This is the time of year where if they were in Vermont, they're going to be leaving so that they can move um, further north and um, establish their breeding territory as well. And so these guys are most frequently reported in the Champlain Valley as well. And we're not sure if there's been a recent breeding pair or a breeding pair at all of this bird in Vermont, but th we have had sightings of them. So this one, right, so same hunting habitat as the short-eared, but listen, Hootie, they actually like to build nests or use nests of other raptors in trees. So that's where they're going to be broadcasting their sound from, is the woodland, in order to establish territory and a mate. Hence the hootie sound. All right. Who else do we have? 
So I love this photo. I don't know where it came from. It, if you Google barred owl, this photo pops up everywhere. And everybody's used it. And I don't think anybody attributes it to anyone. But somebody should get credit for it, I think, because it's pretty amazing. How many of you have seen a barred owl before? Yes. OK, that's because it's the most common owl in Vermont. This is one of our larger owls. These guys like forest woodlands and wooded swamps. They really need um, dead trees. And um, trees also that would support maybe a red tail or a crow. So if you have a woodland or been near a woodland where there are nesting red tails and crows during the winter time, you want to come back and look and see if there are barred owls nesting in that area. Because sometimes bards will actually build on top of that previous platform from the bird and um, start their own nest. But they also like cavities, so you can put up barred owl boxes for them. So um, St. Mike's, I want to say, St. Mike's has a natural area now that they've just um, recently opened a little bit more to the public. Um, and one of the professors there has started putting up barred owl boxes. So it would be really cool to see if um, they get more nesting owls there. I believe he put up a screech owl box, too, and within um, like a week and a half, there was a screech owl in it. So really good stuff. Um, and again, this is the time of year, right? These guys are going to be, let me just double check here, eggs, March, April, hatch, April, May, fledge, May, and June. And the young are fed by the adults until late summer and early fall. So this owl has one of the largest repertoires of sounds of all of the owls. How many of you have heard the myth about bears hooting in the woods? Oh yeah, right? Don't get in an argument with a Vermonter about whether or not that's really a bear. I learned my lesson on that one. But unfortunately, when you talk to bear biologists, they tell you about um, the vocal cords and the range of bears. They just can't make that same sound. And whenever I have talked to someone who tells me the story of hearing a bear hoot in the woods, and I say, what does it sound like? The person says something like, who cooks, who cooks for you all? So they'll be like, hoo, 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 hoo. And I'm like, yeah, barred owl. And they're like, no, it's a bear. So, and what's even more fascinating about that myth is it originates in Vermont. So it's kind of cool to kind of trace that um, kind of cultural story that's built up over time. I would love to work with, um, what's the, the Folk Life Center to like kind of really dig into that and maybe do some interviews and figure out maybe where that story started from and how long ago. It's pretty cool. All right, so speaking of vocalizations, it's not a bear, it's gonna be a barred owl. And what biologists do, people that study birds is they put words to the patterns and the pauses for birds in order to kind of better describe them and be able to identify them later on. So that who cooks for you, who cooks for you all is the pattern and the set of words that most sounds like the tones of what the barred owl actually sounds like. So we're going to try to make those sounds. And we're just going to start with the words. But you have to make an owl face first. Can you make an owl face? Can you go, who? Who? And then we're going to go, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? It's a really good start, you guys. But we're not going to get any owls to come into us if we sound like that, right? But that's a great place to start. And what's really wonderful about barred owls is they're really super social. And they'll call during the day and they'll call at night as well. And so if you hear a barred owl and you're able to respond back to it, it is likely that it will call back to you. And it is likely that it will fly in and check you out. So it is worth practicing. So I discovered this talent that I have for calling owls. Um, when I was canoeing with some friends one night with some libations, and I thought I was being cool, and I, we were on this beautiful lake in New Hampshire, and I started to call back to the owls, and the owls called to me, and the next thing you knew, there were like two or three different owls right near us along the lake shore. It was really wonderful. And years ago, years later in my career, 
after libations in a canoe on the lake. I was working for the Audubon Society and I was leading an owl prowl. And um, normally you use a tape recorder and, you know, well, back in the day you used a tape recorder, you probably use an iPod now. Um, I had a tape recorder and I was out with 20 people and this was at Green Mountain Audubon. And I was, you know, we had owls there and I'm playing the recorder and the next thing you know the battery dies. And I'm like, no, I have to deliver, I have to bring these people an owl. And so I thought, eh, I'll give it a try. And so I went, <laughs> and we waited, and we waited. And I was like, oh, God, please. And in the distance, we heard one call back. <laughs> and I was like, yes. And since then, I've never led a owl prowl with a, any kind of audio. I just use my own voice, and it's become a great party trick <laughs> as well during the winter. And it does actually work. So what's great is if you make the owl face, <laughs> and you can round out your mouth and make that sound. <coughs> Use your diaphragm. Good. <coughs> Perfect. They're suckers for even a halfway good barred owl call. And they will come and check you out. So these guys also do um, some other different calls. Mainly the calls are to attract a mate and to establish territory. And it's also a way for them to stay in touch with each other across a wooded landscape. So during this time of year, you might also hear the caterwauling where they, it sounds like monkeys in the woods. Now, if somebody comes to you and says there are monkeys in the woods, you're like, yeah, it's the owls again. It's not the bears. It's not monkeys, it's the owls. So they get going, they're like, And you're like, what is going on? And it's those guys that are all starting to talk back and forth to each other, getting really riled up and excited. There's a big party going out there with owls. Now, later on in the season, as we get into June and July, and the fledglings have come out, there's another sound that is worse than the barred owl sound. And the first time I ever heard it, I was in Moortown in the woodlands. And I was out gardening late in the day. It was during the summertime. And dusk was coming, and it's getting dark. <clears throat> and I'm finishing up, and I kept hearing this sound that went, Tip! Tip! And I was like, holy cow, what is that? And we were in a spot where there was contiguous forest. It was right near um, the Sugarbush area and all of that. So I figured, man, it could just be anything. And I went out thinking, well, maybe I'll call it in with an owl call. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's a bobcat. I don't know. And I went out and did the barred owl call a number of times, and I had three zip, 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 come in close to me, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm either going to get torn to bits, <laughs> or this is going to be really cool. And it was really cool, and then I felt really bad, because it was three fledgling barred owls that were doing their begging call for food. I had nothing. Sorry, compost pile is over there. Go. Um, so this huge range of um, vocalizations is really, really amazing with barred owls from the territory and courtship calls to the social calls that they have between each other to the begging calls of the young. And it's something that we can kind of hear throughout the seasons, kind of starting back in February and all the way through the summertime. One of the best resources to kind of study up on owl sounds is through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They actually have an Owls of North America CD set. And I think the barred owl alone is one CD because there's just so much there. It's really amazing. If you get really good, you can um, distinguish the difference between male and female. Female has a little bit of a tremolo, a vibrato on the ooh. So it kind of has a little vibrato on the end. So make sure if you're calling back, you, you know, call as the right, you know, opposite to what you're hearing. Otherwise, it'll really get intense and you don't want that. So let's listen to the real thing and then I'm going to get you guys to do the full call. This is another gorgeous shot from Bob Salter. He's from up in Highgate. Another great bird photographer who hooked me up with some photos. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
You just want to run out in the woods and start going. <laughs> That's a female. You hear that little vibrato on the end there? Just that little bit of on the end. It was a nice female. How many of you guys have heard that? Oh, good. All right, now let's try to make the call together. So we're going to get that owl face going. Back in the back of the throat. Support it with your diaphragm, and we'll do that who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. But make it hootie, okay? Are you ready? One, two, three. Oh, nice. <laughs> when you make yourself a little bit different in the bird world, that's more attractive to a mate. Just be careful. Be careful. <laughs> awesome. All right. So here's my story I was telling you about. Um, this year, everybody's sending me pictures. I got a barred owl in my backyard. It's sitting on my feeder. It landed on my face. La, la, la. All this stuff. I'm like, I have not seen one yet. How come everybody else is getting to see barred owls and I'm not getting to see one? And I live in St. Albans City, so I'm within the city limits, but I do have a nice woodland area, thanks to all of my neighbors um, behind us, and we have this beautiful little brook that comes through. So we have this little kind of maybe two-acre snippet of, of wildness there. And so one morning as I'm feeling sorry for myself and I'm you know, walking back from the bus stop, I go to fill up the bird feeders and I come across this. This was literally, I think it was last week. And this is a print from a barred owl in the snow in my backyard. And these shadows right here are from my kid's climbing structure. <gasps> So then I was trying to figure out, did it sit on the climbing structure and then like drop down to get something? So this is our yardstick here. So you could see the length of the, the width of the wingspan. So you've got these outer feather edges. Look at that. You get the primaries right in there, all the like the little digits of the feathers on the outside. Here's the tail right here. This is where the tail dragged. I don't know what, if this was the edge of the tail as it came in and had to bank hard to hit this spot here. So this is where the talons went in. There's actually um, a set of three like little indentations here where it's possible that the bird kind of hopped, kind of came out of that and we got all of the talons imprinted in the snow and this is where the face was when it came in for the landing to hit whatever this prey item is. And it's most likely that Hopefully it got it with its talons rather than its face because the snow was very deep there. It was over six inches deep and a whole layer of ice underneath. So I was like in heaven. I was like, this is great. I didn't get to see it, but I know they're here and they're here in the city, within the city limits. It's so awesome. So very seemingly adaptable species, which is great. So these guys are doing all right across the landscape. We can still help them out, um, kind of lengthening um, timber harvest time, um, maintaining uh, kind of an aged forest structure because they really do like older trees. And what's amazing in that little two-acre plot in our backyard, we have some very, very old large trees, very big around, and lots of snags because we've watched woodpeckers and sapsuckers and chickadees go in and out of a number of nests there in the woodlands. Yes. Anybody ever seen one of these before? Yeah? Good. All right. Question? Yes. No. So the tracks, the, and what's great now that everything has started to melt is you could see where the prey were. So they were all tunneling underneath the snow. So um, white-footed mice and voles and moles are still active during the wintertime. We have another species of mouse that does hibernate, but white-footed and moles, and moles and voles stay active. And so those are all the little tunnels that as the snow melts, watch, because you'll see those little tunnels going through the snow. They're only about like that big around. And so these owls, that amazing sense of hearing, those facial discs, they can hear 
the rodents moving underneath the snow. And that's what they're keying in on. Um, and so they'll often sit and, and you get this whole head tilt thing that they're doing as they're waiting and watching and then they drop in um, for the kill, which is why this winter was so very hard for them. Ice, lots of snow, ice again, um, and probably very hard on a lot of those, um, here's a good word for you, subnivian. The subnivian zone. Throw that down at the dinner table tonight. People will be like, whoa. So that means um, animals that live in, underneath in that snow layer. And when we do get a lot of snow, it's actually warmer deeper down underneath the snow. One of the activities we used to do at the Audubon Society with little kids is we would give them little film canisters of jello that hadn't been gelatinized yet. So we would mix up the jello, everybody gets a film canister, and now we're gonna go outside. You put it somewhere where you think it's gonna be the warmest it can be. And then we'd go inside and read stories and do a puppet show and everything, and then we would come back outside, and everybody would find their little container and pop it open, and we'd, we'd blop it out and see who's stayed all liquidy. And the kids that buried them deep in the snow, those were the ones that were most likely to stay more liquid because it's much warmer once we get a nice dense layer of snow. That's why all those guys can do all right underneath there. Awesome. Subnivian. This guy is going to bust through anybody's subnivian zone and eat them. This guy will also eat many of those smaller owls, including the barred owl, if it can. So if you take two two-liter bottles of soda or seltzer and you stack them one on top of another, that's about how big this owl is. So this is a great horned owl. It's our largest nesting breeding owl that we have. Um, it has bright yellow eyes and ear tufts, and that's so that it blends in. I look at all this dead wood in here, and if we were looking at this bird from a distance, those little ear tufts are going to blend in and look just like the sticks um, and the debris that are around that bird. So whereas the barred owl doesn't like forest fragmentation, these guys are actually all right with it. So they're a little bit more ad adaptable. They don't mind like a messy... Um, kind of up and down forest um, mosaic. So they are very tolerant of habitat changes. Here in Vermont, um, they will nest in a number of different types of places. That's why there's so many little icons across the bottom. So they'll use great blue heron nests. They'll use red hawk, red tail hawk nests. They'll nest in cavities that are in live trees. They'll nest in cavities that are in dead trees. They'll do platforms. They'll go into buildings or little overhangs or underhangs under things as well. So they are our second most common owl in Vermont, and they're mainly in the Champlain Valley. Um, so these guys also have a really cool um, vocal repertoire, not as extensive as barred owl, and it's much deeper. So you have to drop down into your lower register if you're going to do this one. So this one does, who's awake, me too. So, ooh, 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 but we're going to make it better than that. Um, and they will respond. I was really surprised when I was, um, when I was teaching up at Hog Island off the coast of Maine um, for Maine Audubon, um, and I was out on the island before everybody else arrived for the summertime. The great horned owls were calling out there, and I thought, you know, I've called in a couple barred owls before. I might as well try a great horned owl. And so I dropped into a lower register. <coughs> And I had two great horned owls fly in above me like that. And I was like, there's no one here to see this with me. I'm all alone on an island. Um, but it was very, very cool. So this is another one that if you learn how to mimic it, you can get it to call back. All right, are you ready? It's your turn. Who's awake? Me too. All right. And now we're going to make it super hooty. Here we go. Go low, as low as you can. All right. One, two, three. OK, that's like too staccato as an owl. <laughs> but we might fool them. So these guys will not be in the same territory as the barred owl. So if you have a barred owl, don't call like a great horned owl. They don't like to hang out near each other. One eats the other one, and they also compete for food. So 
when we find great horned owls, they tend to be in different forests than where there's established barred owls around. And this one, we don't have a lot of great, we have some records of them, um, but they are declining. So we are starting to see declines um, through the breeding bird surveys, and we're also seeing declines in them um, across the region. And our Christmas bird count data also is showing declines. Now the tough thing with that is these guys are active at night. So one of the hard things is getting people out at night to be able to figure out if those birds are actually around. So if you practice and you go out, <laughs> you might be able to call one in and, and then get us that, that data that we need. I have a friend um, who came and birded up in the um, Franklin County Christmas bird count this year. Um, and he's like another, you know, 20 something year old who can be out until two or three in the morning calling owls in the middle of nowhere. And he found a great horned owl in Franklin County this year. So it's very exciting to have that data point. All right. Here's what they sound like. higher pitched, she's actually the one that's closer, and the one that's responding is the male. He's a little lower pitched. Me again? I still hear crickets. Ooh, ooh. He got interrupted. <laughs> Anybody heard this one before? Ooh, good in the back. A couple people. Nice. difference between the two? Yep. So kind of fun to start to train your ear to listen to those subtle differences and then know how I actually have a pair here in, in the area. All right. Now we're going to move into some special owls. So all of those owls were the ones that we've documented here that have been breeding here or our casual residents that show up that we know are here on the landscape. Now we're going to go into the owls that are like, go out and see this owl if anybody tells you that it's around, because they're awesome. All right, so we're going to go back to tiny, teeny, tiny, but not as tiny as the northern sawwet owl. This one, man, is on my bucket list. And I, I, there are records of it in Franklin County. There are records of it in Montgomery and Richford. And there are there are community stories, right? So nowadays we're so reliant on eBird and being able to look up where, where people are seeing birds, but there's people who don't even know that eBird exists yet. And so there are those stories that start to go through the community that people tell, and then that sometimes they get back around to me and then I gotta trace it back and see if I can get permission to go up. And uh, there's been a couple of stories that are coming out of the Richford area about this owl. And I'm actually leading an owl prowl up in Richford tomorrow night. So, you know, fingers crossed. Although, it's, it's more likely we'll get bards. So this is another one of the smaller owls. It, we are at the very, like, we're just outside of the southern end of this, of this bird's range. This bird really um, is much further north in the boreal and montane forests, much more common in Alaska um, and obviously Canada. So they are small, they have no ear tufts, they have yellow eyes, and the big difference for this one, and hopefully we're not going to the sound right away, yep, so there's sawwet. So the big difference in telling the sawwet and the boreal apart is you want to look at that facial disc and you want to look for the black line around the facial disc, okay? So that's the big. So they're kind of darker more so throughout. Sawwets tend to have like a reddish tone to them, and boreal, the boreal owls have a much darker tone and that darker ring around the facial disc. So these guys rely on mature dead trees for roosting and nesting, and they're very sensitive to clear cutting and other forest management practices. So if we find out that we have those in the area, a lot of work would be done to do outreach to landowners and figure out um, what's happening on that landscape that is there already that that bird likes. And, and how do we keep that there or improve it? Um, I think I have the call for this one. Let's see. Or maybe I don't. I might not have. Nope. 
Okay, so the reason why I didn't do calls for these is because we're not likely to hear them. Um, but boreal owl, I think the last report that was going through the community was probably about two years ago. Um, and then there have been historical records going back into the um, early 1900s for this bird. Um, but no records recently of them either being here or breeding here. All right, but then there's this one. Oh. So this is the northern hawk owl. When my husband and I first started dating, like the true test was, hey, jump in the car. We're going to drive three hours to go see this bird. <laughs> That's really rare. You want to go? He had a really good bird list, too, right away when we started dating. Um, and we're married now, so he passed the test. Um, so northern hawk owls are an eruptive species. So when I say eruptive, that means that sometimes they push into the area in great numbers, and other years they're not there at all. And typically, this kind of ebbs and flows with the prey availability, like we were talking about with barred owls and some of the other ones. So when there's a big boom in the population, um, we're going to have a lot of owls that are born, and then the next year tends to be a bust, and the young birds have to pu get pushed out by the older, more mature birds. So that's the great thing about this bird, is some years when they, we can predict how um, the lemming population is going or the meadow vole population is going, we can say this is a year when it's likely to happen. Um, and because we have this in the data, um, we, can, we can make some of those predictions. So a couple years ago, there was one in Waterbury. Um, years ago before that, the one that I took my husband to see was in Eden. These guys are called a hawk owl because when they fly and when they perch in their posture and in their flight pattern, they resemble acipiters like a Cooper's hawk or um, a Sharpie or um, like a falcon in flight. So they just fly very differently than most other owls. They're very, very quick and sharp in the way that they move. Um, and the way that they perch. So these guys are crazy too because they're diurnal, which is awesome, right? So this is a bird you don't have to go out at night to see. You can go out during the day and it'll be there and it'll be hunting. They like to perch on little teeny tiny branches on the tops of things. And so when you get to the spot where people have been reporting one, you just scan the tops of all the trees and boom, there's that, there's that owl shape sitting up, right? Or maybe it looks more hawk shape like and once you get your binoculars on it, you do that happy dance because it's a new bird that's like really super cool. So these guys, daytime percher, um, normally up in the boreal forest, but they're going to get pushed down here. They like to settle into a place for a long period of time. So that was the other cool thing in Eden and Waterbury is once this owl was spotted, you knew it was going to be there for a while. So it was finding food. It was doing well. And so it stuck around and a lot of people um, got to see it. There's actually little known about them because they're very difficult to um, be able to study on their breeding grounds. And they have similar hunting habitats <laughs> and are in competition, although that's part of the reason why they fly during the day and not at night or dusk. So they compete with um, boreal owls, long-eared owls, short-eared owls, and the showstopper that we're going to see at the end of the show here that I'm not going to give away. It's the giant one. Look at this guy. Well, just checking you out. See how that whole body shape, that whole silhouette is not very owl-like? It's very tapered, right? And that allows them to, to kind of be able to fly a little bit differently and faster, be a little bit quicker in their motions. Hence, that's why they have the name that they have. They're so serious, too. Look at, he's got some, like, eyebrow action going on there. Another great photo from Bob Salter. All right, I know, everybody, er, I'm like, snowy owls, okay, they're awesome. All right, snowy owls are another one of those eruptive species, so we look for that, that crash in the um, rodent population up in the um, Arctic tundra. These guys, I if you've seen some of the National Geographic shows of these guys, they're hardcore. I mean, they nest on the ground, and they have to fight off foxes and coyotes and wolves and all of that and other birds of prey. Um, and they're just totally exposed um, in, a <laughs> in a habitat that is, is brutal and bright all the time, right? So these guys don't fly at night because they don't even really know what that is based on where they're from. 
Um, so November and March are the peak times for these birds to erupt in our area. And they are uh, the heaviest owl around um, at four pounds. So they have a, a lot of weight and strength behind them because of what they have to be able to survive. The females um, have the dark barring on them. So this is a female. Um, the immature males also have a little bit more of a, of a bib to them. So the white will drop down on the chest so that you could tell the difference between an immature male and female. And the immature male will also be white all through the back of the head. So if you just get the back shot, maybe you'll be able to tell if it's a male or female. This one looks kind of happy, I think. And then the mature males tend to be gorgeous white. Here's another great shot from Tyler Pocket. Um, and they have that nice crisp white throughout with a little bit of the black detailing on the tips of some of the feathers. These guys sound like seals when they call. Ooh, 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 ooh. It's not attractive at all. <laughs> Except unless you're a snowy owl. All right. Showstopper. <gasps> okay, this is the biggest owl. So, two feet tall, five foot wingspan. I'm five foot four. Five foot wingspan. So, these guys are extremely rare, but they're another eruptive species. And they do show up from time to time. They've been seen in Burlington, Vermont in past years, in like somebody's backyard. Judy's going, yes. I think when I was back at Echo, there were reports of, of one in the area. Um, and so the other place that they do tend to pop, um, pop down into, oddly, a places right around Montreal. There's a lot of great habitat around Montreal that's really awesome for a lot of these different birds. So a nice birding excursion and weekend in, in Montreal would be great. So a couple years ago, um, this species showed up in New Hampshire and everybody was going to see it. One of the things that you, know, you want to make sure is before you're like, I saw a great gray owl, is make sure it's not a barred owl. Because size can be very deceiving when the bird is very far away from you. So you really want to look for this little, little kind of mustache thing going on down here, right? So these little white patches on either side of the tip of the beak um, are distinctive for the great gray owl. Also, I feel like the facial disc is just huge and flattened, right? It's just really, really big. Um, and again, these guys are arboreal species, so they need to be adapted to where they live. What's crazy is most of the body on this bird is fluff. So it weighs less than the snowy owl, even though it's bigger than the snowy owl. So by body mass, it's actually 15% um, smaller than um, even the great horned owl. So big and fluffy, and so you really don't have to worry when they get super friendly that it's going to be too heavy on your head. So this actually happened in New Hampshire the last time great grays erupted into our region. This owl, um, and the, the birders were being really good about it. They you know, spread the word about you know, ethics and not baiting the bird you know, and trying to get it to come in closer and all of that. And they were a good distance away. But this bird, being from the boreal region, didn't really have a lot of interaction with people. And that was just another perch to sit on and, and hunt from. And every time I see this photo, I'm like, oh, I would so take a talon to the head, the trip to the hospital for stitches and all of that to have an owl land on my head. Anybody here ever had an owl land on their head? No. Doesn't count if you've been able to go to some of the banding stations for birds like Sawets. This is another awesome photo by Tyler. Check this out. Look at the furry legs. So they have feathers all the way down their legs because they need to be able to adapt to the weather that we're having. How many of you heard about the, um, the hawk that was in Maine this year? The, um, what was it? Great gray hawk. I think that was the species. Showed up in Maine, supposed to be down in like Texas, South America, in Maine as we moved through winter. And unfortunately, it didn't do very well. It got frostbite. And one day, a number of birders found it on the ground. They took it to a rehab center. And unfortunately, they weren't able um, to save the bird because the frostbite had set in so badly on its legs. And you could see that from the way that that bird was designed, right? No feathers along 
the legs to be able to protect it from the, the cold weather. And we see that in a lot of these owls, right down to the little teeny tiny screech owl. They're designed um, to be able to survive where and how they do. So here's how we can pay it forward for owls. Um, I hope today that if you didn't love owls before you came in here, you are like now you're a lover of owls. And for those of you who already loved owls, that like you've just fallen in love all over again. And while you're in that emotional state, I want to tell you that there are things that you can do and things that we can do as individuals and as community members to make sure that these birds stay on the landscape and actually are able to adapt and shift and be resilient in the face of climate change moving forward. So we have things like leaving standing dead wood where it's appropriate. If it's dangerous, of course, take it down. But if you can leave that, that big tree, change your mindset from it being big, ugly, and dead to something that is going to support a number of different species, including owls. Nest boxes, when you don't have that great project to do, we want to get them up before February so that they have that spot. If you do have an owl around, minimize disturbance. Tell everybody else, too. Owls are stressed during the winter time. We want to observe them from a distance. Binoculars, scope, something like that. Um, when controlling rodents, opt for traps rather than poison. In your community, if you're on your select board or a conservation commission, talk about um, uh, decreasing habitat fragmentation and improving wildlife connectivity where you live so that we keep habitats connected and we keep these places where the birds need to roost, um, nest, and feed like the grasslands. So we can also work with um, each other on that and providing ways to support farmers in um, delayed cutting um, regimes as well. And individual reports are so important to understanding owls in Vermont. Um, and so what I try to do is get people, if you don't want to use eBird or you don't want to report things online, make friends with somebody who does and help us gather the data that we need so that we can learn a little bit more about how these birds are existing on the landscape. Here's our photographers, Zach Coda, John Van Hosen, Tyler Paquette, Robert Salter, and Joanne Russo all gave me photos for free, so I thank them all so much for their beautiful work that they do. And if you want to get in touch with me, that is where I'm at. My website is birddiva.com. I've got tons of activities that are happening all over the state this year. And if you would like to host a private walk on your own land with your friends, um, we can do that as well. So. I thank you all for being here today, and I want to take questions from you if you have any. I think anyone who has questions can um, ask the questions, and people that need to need to leave can leave. And I, I have tons of questions myself, so. Ah. There, now it's on. All right. Anybody's questions? Here we go. We've got one there. Good. Are there any snowy owls around? This year, we haven't had as many sightings of snowy owls. I think there was one on the Colchester Causeway. So some years, we have a really big pop, and there's a lot of them that show up at all at once. But pretty much any winter, it's likely that you'll get like one or two. This just wasn't one of the big winters for that bird. And you had to go out the causeway to get it. <laughs> Microphone's coming back. Unless you're feeling like you've got a power voice. She's like, no, I know. There we go. Yeah. So she said the barred owl, where does it come from? How did they name it? And so the barred part comes from the barring that's on the chest. The, 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 um, the coloration, the pattern on the chest is where that comes from. Yep. Yes. You can ask a general, no, that's not allowed. Yes, of course, you can ask a general bird question. So I've been down to um, Kingsland Bay to see the bald eagle nest, but with all the frozen water, like what's, uh, 
What were they eating? And are they eating ducks? Or? Yeah. So she asked, um, there's an eagle down at Kingsland Bay. It's all frozen over. And we know that the lake froze in its, in, well, you know, except for where the ferry was moving through in a couple spots here. But for the most part, it froze right over this year. So it made it really hard for a lot of those birds as well and pushed waterfowl into different areas. So what eagles are doing is they're looking for where those pockets of water are, where all the waterfowl congregate, and they'll go and take out ducks there. They're also bullies. They're lazy, so they will go and beat up other birds for food. So if you think about the seagulls, so the other place that I like to go and look for bald eagles is where people are ice fishing because they throw the fish scraps on the, on the ice. The gulls will take off with them or the crows will, and then the eagles will beat up the seagull or the crow to try to get the food from them. So, yeah. That's what they're doing this time of year. So when we have years where there's more open water, both in the riverways and the, and the lakes, we tend to see the bald eagles a little, well, and, and that's actually, I shouldn't say that because they would disperse more. It's the years like this where you can, where you know where those pockets are, that that's where they all are. I also like as stuff starts to ice out now, you want to pay attention to where those spots are. I live up in St. Albans and as the bay starts to thaw out and all the waterfowl move in to migrate, that's, that's where we go to find the eagles. I've had five eagles at one, in one spot on the bay up there before. It's pretty cool. And one add on, are snow geese back? Snow geese are starting to come back now. Um, they're not congregating. On the, on the return flight, they don't tend to have the same stopover spots and be in um, the same numbers as we see them during spring migration. I can't remember, there are, I think there's some reports I can't, there's been a couple of videos that have been going online. I'm trying to see if I can remember in my head where. Um, but they are um, kind of um, centered up along the St. Lawrence Seaway, so they're going to follow that back up. So when we don't get them here, you just have to start to think about where are those other spots. And nowadays, I like to go to the New York side of the lake during the spring or during the fall migration to see them rather down in Addison County. They're actually up towards the northern end of the lake on the New York side in much larger numbers than they are down here. Thank you very, 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 very much. You're welcome. Come up and ask questions if you have any other ones.